Hello, Endeavor here. I recently read the essay The Power of the Powerless by Václav Havel. In 1978, he was a political dissident in communist Czechoslovakia who would go on to become the first president of Czechoslovakia and later the Czech Republic following the fall of communism in 1989. The essay is about what can be done by an ordinary citizen in resistance to what Havel called a post-totalitarian system. He described Czechoslovakia in the 1970s as post-totalitarian because it was no longer a classical dictatorship like the Stalinist Soviet Union, where dissenters were regularly thrown into a gulag or put up against a wall and shot. Instead, it relied on a network of institutions loyal to the communist ideology of the regime, creating an atmosphere of fear, repression, and self-censorship which traps the individual inside the system. Havel famously uses the example of a green grocer who puts up a sign in his store window which reads, Workers of the World Unite. The rallying cry written by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels at the end of the Communist Manifesto. The act of placing the sign in his window is not a vow of genuine belief in communism on the part of the green grocer, but a display of his submission to the regime. No one who walks by will notice the Workers of the World Unite sign. It's practically elevator music to anyone living in Czechoslovakia. But by not displaying the sign, he might out himself as a troublemaker, as someone who is not compliant with the system, thus bringing the pressure of the regime down upon him. So he displays the sign as his way of saying he is compliant, and in doing so, he's living within the lie of the communist system. He might not actually believe in the principles found in the Communist Manifesto, but he will pay lip service to them because the system based on them has power over him. The sign signals to others that they must do the same in order to not out themselves as wrong thinkers. Someone who likewise doesn't actually care too much about the workers of the world uniting might decide to display the sign, lest the green grocer, who gives the outward appearance of supporting the system, but inwardly might not, would identify this other citizen as a dissident. Havel stated that the power of the powerless lies in their ability to live within the truth, to not go along with the lies which the system uses to keep the population under control. He wrote that power is not something that can be done away with, it's relational and ultimately relies on the population's willingness to submit to it. By taking down the sign which reads, Workers of the World Unite, the green grocer will have begun to live in the truth. He is no longer displaying his submission to the regime. In his mind, it no longer has the same amount of power over him. Others might notice that he has taken down the sign and either take it down if they are displaying it themselves or be more skeptical whenever they see it. They too will have started to live in the truth. Havel writes that from this point, communities can be formed which live in the truth. This is the process through which the illusion which the post-totalitarian system uses to control the population begins to wane. I'm far from the first commentator on the dissident right to point out the similarities between the post-totalitarian system which Havel was describing in the 1970s and the West as it exists today. Day. I might be a little bit less optimistic about the power of the powerless than Havel, mainly because when he was writing in the 1970s, right over the Iron Curtain were the Western liberal democracies, an alternative political bloc which was much more powerful than the communist bloc which Havel was dissenting against. Today, it's those liberal democracies which have become totalitarian and there's no similar counterbalance. Nevertheless, I do believe that Václav Havel's Power of the Powerless is well worth a read for anyone who considers themselves a dissenter against the system of globalism today. The resemblance between the post-totalitarian system Havel describes and the system which exists in the West today surely is uncanny. In the same way that the sign which read, Workers of the World Unite was a symbol of compliance to the communist system in Czechoslovakia, today, the rainbow flag or the medical face mask serve as symbols of compliance to the system of globalism. Take the mask, for example. A guy could be wearing it not because he actually believes that a deadly pandemic is going on and that it will protect him, but because he sees some woman wearing it and he thinks that she will scold him for not doing so. Simultaneously, that very person who he wears the mask to avoid a confrontation with could be only wearing it because she is afraid that he will scold her for not wearing it. So it gets two people who have not exactly bought into the dogma to go along with the lie in fear of being outed as a wrong thinker. By taking off the mask, the man begins to live in the truth. And by doing so, the woman might see that he has taken off the mask and do the same. Now they have a group of people who are living in the truth which can grow from there. It's certainly applicable to the present day, and again, I'm far from the first person to point this out. But what I want to look at here is not the similarities between the communist system Havel wrote about and the present day, but what I believe to be a fundamental difference between the two. And I believe that this can be found in the slogan, Workers of the World Unite, itself. 
It's the rallying cry for a worldwide revolution to bring about a classless workers' utopia, completing Marx's historical dialectic. The slogan dates back to the 19th century. Now, let's contrast that with analogous slogans employed in the West today. Diversity is our strength, Black Lives Matter, Stay Home, Save Lives, Our Democracy, Build Back Better, Stand With Ukraine. They are all similar to the Workers of the World Unite slogan from the Communist Manifesto in that they are these Orwellian pledges of submission to a totalitarian system. But the fundamental difference is that rather than prophesizing the completion of a grand historical civilizational process like is implied by the slogan Workers of the World Unite, these slogans, which are used today in the form of Twitter hashtags, are only applicable to events of a two or three month window then discarded and replaced with a new slogan of compliance to the globalist system. I believe that what separates the communist tyranny Havel was writing about in the 1970s and the globalist tyranny which rules the Western world today is that the former was a modernist tyranny and the latter is a postmodernist tyranny. I recently reread the book The Postmodern Condition by Jean-Francois Lyotard. In the book, Lyotard defines postmodernism as the loss of the belief in grand historical meta narratives. Back in 2020, I made a video about this book and how postmodernity helps explain the death of the historical epic film genre. Here, I want to apply these same ideas to explain the ever-shifting narratives which are used to control the populations of the Western world today. First, what is a meta-narrative? It's the perception of history as this great story which forms the basis for how we understand society. It's the lens through which we understand our societal knowledge and experiences, and it legitimizes society as a process of completing some grand plan. A meta-narrative is often based on a religion. The story of creation, divinity, and salvation found in the Bible forms Christianity's meta-narrative. God created the world, he gave his word to the prophets, he came down to earth in human form and died to bring salvation to mankind. This is the grand historical meta-narrative which the West lived under from the late Roman Empire until the 18th or 19th centuries. The Enlightenment is another meta-narrative. The view of history that humanity is progressing towards a greater society through technological and intellectual advancements. Likewise, Marxism is also a meta-narrative. The narrative that history can be understood through the lens of class struggle. That one day the proletariat will overthrow the bourgeoisie and create a class-free egalitarian utopia, which would bring about the end of history as class struggle would end. And this is the one I want to focus on here since I'm comparing the old communist bloc to the West today. But I will say that I don't believe that meta-narratives are necessarily a bad thing. I think that people just naturally form their understanding of truth through narrative. And a meta-narrative is just a narrative that's much longer in society-wide. A religion such as Christianity provided the West with a stable meta-narrative which it flourished under for centuries. I think there are plenty of problems with the meta-narrative of enlightenment as I've pointed out on my channel before. The problem with communism wasn't that it's a meta-narrative, but it's that it was a bad meta-narrative which reinforced a tyrannical system. Belief in the worldwide revolution of the proletariat over the bourgeoisie and the creation of an egalitarian workers' utopia was the meta-narrative that upheld the communist system. But today, in postmodernity, we no longer believe in such grand historical narratives. We no longer believe in things like God, the nation, the West, the proletariat, or the bourgeoisie. So how does the current system of globalist tyranny legitimize itself, since power is legitimized through narratives? It seems to me that rather than one overarching societal narrative through which people understand the world, the West is directed by a series of mini-narratives which change from one month to the next on the whims of political power. Let's just look at how radically the various narratives have changed over the last two years. At the beginning of 2020, you were supposed to believe that there was this deadly pandemic going around and that it's your civic duty to stay in your home watching Netflix 24-7 and to wear a mask everywhere. In the middle of 2020, you were supposed to believe that the Western world, the United States in particular, was an oppressive white supremacist society and that it was your moral imperative to tear everything perceived to be white down, especially the institution of law enforcement. Canada went through something similar in summer 2021 with the mass graves hoax. 
in late 2020 and early 2021, in the United States, you were supposed to believe that America was this great democracy whose democratic ideals were under attack by Donald Trump and his right-wing extremist followers. The institution of the police, who were only months ago condemned as defenders of white supremacy, after January 6, 2021, were hailed as these brave defenders of democracy. In Canada, you were supposed to believe the same thing about the truckers' protests in early 2022. Then, for the rest of 2021, the pandemic narrative was brought back into the forefront, and you were supposed to believe that it was now your civic duty to take a certain medication, all in the name of saving lives. Anyone who didn't take this medication was to be cast out of society. They weren't to be allowed to have a job or go to a restaurant or a retail store or even receive medical attention if needed. They were the moral outgroup for whom no sympathy or mercy was to be shown. Now in 2022, you're supposed to believe that Russia is a threat to democracy and that paying ridiculously high food and gas prices caused by the policies of Western governments is your way of supporting Ukraine. And you're supposed to cheer along as Western governments antagonize a nuclear power. If you're a boomer, you're supposed to see the Russia-Ukraine conflict as analogous to World War II, or rather Hollywood movies made about World War II. And if you're a millennial, you're supposed to see the conflict as analogous to Star Wars or Harry Potter. The same people who months ago were on a moral crusade to save lives are now the loudest advocates of policies which risk causing a nuclear conflict. And they always give you someone that you're supposed to hate. One day you're supposed to hate the police and the racists, the next day, you're supposed to hate the conspiracy theorists and the anti-medicationers. Today, they want you to hate the Russians. Tomorrow, they're going to want you to hate the climate change deniers. In a modernist tyranny like the old communist bloc, there was a clear set of principles and narratives one was required to believe in in order to get by in the system. The same could be said about North Korea today. You must believe that Kim Jong-un is God, the Juche ideals have made North Korea a worker's paradise, and that capitalism in the West suck. Now, I'm not saying this is correct, but at least it's logically consistent and the narratives are permanent. North Koreans believe the same thing they believed 30 years ago, more or less. But in a postmodern tyranny, it's not even clear what exactly you're supposed to believe. What you're supposed to believe is whatever is beneficial to the elites and the cause of globalism at any given time. And it changes so rapidly that anyone could find themselves in trouble for wrong think. Meaning they will twist themselves into knots in order to come down on the right side of the power structure. A great example of this today is how we have come to understand science, especially in the last two years. It's interesting what Jean-Francois Lyotard says about science in the postmodern condition. He writes that, in modernity, science was used to legitimize the meta-narratives which society was founded on. An example of this could be found in 17th century Europe. Under the meta-narrative of Christianity, scientists saw science as the practice of revealing God's creation. So through scientific discovery, man was learning more about how God created the world. Under the meta-narrative of the Enlightenment, science was seen as a means of progress. That through scientific discovery, we can advance technologically, morally, and intellectually, bringing about greater prosperity. While under the meta narrative of Marxism, science was seen as a tool through which the proletariat could liberate themselves from the bourgeoisie and the oppression and alienation which capitalism brought about. So, science itself is never and never has been neutral. In modernity, it was understood through the lens of various meta narratives. But in postmodernity, when we no longer believe in meta narratives, science is just determined by the whims of political power at the moment, meaning it can change at any time. This is embodied by the trust the science meme, which has become extremely relevant over the last two years. Think about how many times the science, meaning what those in power are claiming is true, has changed on a dime when it was politically convenient. An absolutely incredible example of this happened in summer 2020. In spring of that year, at the beginning of the so-called pandemic, people were instructed to stay inside their homes for all hours of the day. The expert said that as much as meeting one of your friends at the park was to risk spreading a certain deadly illness. There were a few protests against these policies in spring 2020 in some cities, which only had a couple hundred attendees. These demonstrations were condemned by health officials for recklessly spreading this illness. But then only a few weeks later, there were the BLM protests across the United States and several other countries. 
These had tens of thousands of attendees, but these same health officials didn't condemn them. But rather, they said that the authorities shouldn't try to shut them down. Some even went so far as to suggest that the BLM protests actually slowed down the spread of the illness. So what we saw was one mini-narrative, the pandemic, overlap with another mini-narrative, BLM, and the science had to be updated. This really should have discredited all these institutions which made this claim, but despite a clumsy transition from one mini-narrative to another, they were able to get away with it. In 2021, there were massive protests against forced medications and QR passports. These took place across the world, and many of them had tens of thousands of attendees. The media just gave up on the narrative that these demonstrations spread the illness. It was obviously not true, so they just didn't report on them at all. How were they able to get away with such obvious lies which are just out in the open for all to see? I think it has a lot to do with the ever-present role that media and information plays in our lives today. In his book, Leotard theorized that the nation-states, in the future, would fight wars over information the same way they fought over resources and land in the past. Now, I don't think nation-states are the real players today, the powers that be have superseded those, but their warlike determination to control information is for certain. Today, people are bombarded with information 24-7 via their screens. This constant barrage of information overloads their ability to process any of it. People today do not have the mental capacity to remember what they believed three months ago because in that space of time, they are overwhelmed by one narrative after another to the point where something that only happened a couple months ago, which in another era would be seen as very recent, is perceived as ancient history. Their brain needs to clear its memory space every couple of months to make room for the new information they need to consume. Another great example of this is with the certain medication. People were initially told in early 2021 that this medication was going to end the pandemic. Two shots and then that's it. Then a few months later they were telling us, well, now you actually need to get a third shot. And then they said you'll need to get a fourth shot. And then they said you'll probably need one every few months. People had completely forgotten the original promise because the media information narrative machine had flooded their minds so much over that time that it was just lost in a big sea of information. And in spring 2022, when the negative side effects of this medication are being revealed, the public is now captivated by new narratives about the conflict in Ukraine, and they're no longer interested in this news. There were even a lot of people on the dissident right swept up in this. They proclaimed that the pandemic was over and done with when the news shifted away, seemingly forgetting all the horrible things which were done over the last two years and the collateral damage which will be with us for years to come. This really is how this postmodern tyrannical system is able to get away with the most blatant of lies. The narratives in the public consciousness move so quickly that any inconvenient contradictions which emerge will be lost in the news cycle in a matter of days. So in that respect, the truth simply doesn't matter anymore. You'd think that today in an era when the public has an unprecedented access to information, it would be more difficult for a regime to get away with such obvious lies. But that has not been the case. Because the endless bombardment of false information is able to drown out the truth. Going back to Václav Havel's essay, The Power of the Powerless, the regime which he was opposing in the 1970s in the old Eastern Bloc was a modernist tyranny. The process of passive resistance, which he described, was to chip away at the grand meta-narrative that the communist system was based on. Again, I do think that many of the tactics which he recommended are useful today, but the problem is that the system today is no longer based based on one overarching historical meta-narrative, but many different mini-narratives which fluctuate in their preeminence in the public consciousness. When one of their mini-narratives begins to fall apart, they can just take it out of focus and replace it with another mini-narrative, and the public seems to fall in line again every time. This happened with the pandemic. Once enough discontent was built up in a sizable proportion of the population, they just dropped that narrative and replaced it with the narrative surrounding the Ukraine conflict. And it seems like they've been able to take the public for a ride yet again and bury the animosity which they had accumulated. Now, I don't think it's accurate to say that people don't believe in any kind of meta-narratives today. For example, the narratives of black liberation, decolonization, or certain events during World War II do form what I would call the anti-white meta-narrative. This is a long historical narrative which determines how we understand the issue of race today. Similar narratives exist for gender and sexuality as well. These do resemble meta-narratives. They've been built up since the end of the Second World War, before post-modernity had fully taken effect. What I think has happened over the last few years is that these bigger narratives have been integrated into a more recent system of rapid narrative change. 
They're always active to some degree. The ideology remains in place, and so do the policies. But the narratives fluctuate in their predominance in the public's mind. For example, the anti-white narrative was first and foremost in 2016 before the Trump election, summer 2020, and during major events like the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. But then they take a backseat temporarily when there's a drive to get everyone to take a medication or when they want to fearmonger about Russia or the dangers posed by climate change. This process of control through rapid narrative change is reflected by the behavior of normies on social media or the NPCs as they're now known. There's the new meme, I support the current thing. I think this perfectly captures the essence of postmodern tyranny. The NPC picks up signals from the media what they're supposed to believe today, and on a dime, they adopt their new beliefs and change their profile picture, signaling that they're a good compliant sheep. And consider the symbolism of this. A profile picture is someone's avatar in the digital space which they're increasingly spending their lives. They add an overlay to the avatar, signaling that supporting the current thing is temporarily an integral part of their identity. And the purpose that was served by slogans like, Workers of the World Unite in the 20th Century, is now served by Twitter hashtags. They are a rallying cry in support of the current thing, which will soon be replaced by a new current thing. The strength of this postmodern system of tyranny is that it's able to keep the public in a constant state of fear and hysteria. It allows the elites to make enormous advances in a short period of time to implement agendas which only a few years earlier would have been unthinkable. Just imagine if you had told people in 2019 that in the near future they will have to show a QR code to go to a shopping mall. No one would have accepted that, but yet three years later, here we are. It's a major change from the method of subversion which took place in the decades following World War II. In those years, those who were hostile to the West slowly took over the culture by incrementally changing the psychology of the public through gradually changing the messages they were receiving through media and education. In military terms, those who wished to destroy our civilization in the post-war era waged a cultural war of attrition, while today those in power are launching a blitzkrieg. Another strength of postmodern tyranny is its unparalleled ability to deceive the public. It's extremely difficult to even understand this system because it's not clear what it is exactly. In the 20th century, there were several different kinds of regimes, such as liberal, communist, fascist. Back then, it was at least clear what liberalism, communism, and fascism were. You could say you support one of them or oppose the others, but at least it was understood what those terms meant. Going back to Havel's essay, in the Eastern Bloc, people understood that the system was communist and that dissidents were opposed to communism. And I know, some Marxist idiot on the internet will say, well, Stalinism wasn't real communism, Trotskyism is real communism. But let's cut that crap. We know what communism was. The Eastern Bloc was communist. We understand that. But that's something we can't even manage today. On paper, Western countries are liberal democracies. The United States is technically under the same constitution that it was in the 18th century. But in reality, it's undergone a greater transition as a society in the last two or three decades than Russia went through during the Bolshevik Revolution. I have many criticisms of liberalism, which I've spoken about at length on my channel, but I've come to the realization that many of these criticisms are moot. The system is no longer liberal democracy. It's just continuing to wear the former liberal democratic system as a skin. It's something else. If I had to put a label on it, I'd call it technocratic intersectional anarcho-tyranny. But even if you asked five different people on the dissident right to describe the system, they'd describe it differently. And for the general public, they're still under the illusion that the system is liberal democracy. Now, here's what I think is the disadvantage of this postmodern tyranny from the perspective of the globalist elites who are running it, that is. While its ability to make enormous advances in such a short period of time and deceive the public into going along with it is unprecedented, I have my doubts about the long-term sustainability of this system of rule. Because the absence of a grand overarching meta-narrative which legitimizes the system forces it to constantly come up with new mini-narratives to keep the charade going. To do that, they need one crisis after another with the hysteria permanently turned up to 11. It kind it kind of reminds me of that scene in Wallace and Gromit when Gromit is riding a toy train, but the track is incomplete, so he needs to pick up a box of track pieces and rapidly build the track in front of a moving train. The system allows them to move their train full steam ahead without even having finished the tracks they're riding on yet, but eventually the train is going to crash. Now, it does appear that they have a destination in mind, that being Agenda 2030 and the so-called Sustainable Development Goals. I imagine that they'll try to turn the fight against climate climate change and sustainable development into a new foundational meta-narrative for the new globalist world. 
and that this postmodern blitzkrieg of one phony manufactured crisis after another is just meant to get us to 2030. In theory, that would make their new system post-2030 more sustainable. But I have my doubts that they'll be able to do that because they aren't being honest about their intentions. They need these fake crises to deceive the public in order to get them from one phase to the next. They're trying to implement Agenda 2030 by sneaking it in through the back door. If they were confident that they could create a new meta-narrative through which people would understand the world, why can't they just come out and be honest about what they're trying to implement, if the goal is to get people to sincerely believe in it? Also, why the year 2030? I know that this is the year which the UN set as the target for achieving the so-called sustainable development goals, but why does it have to be 2030? Does it really need to be this rapid? They want to radically transform life on our planet, but they've given themselves such a short timeline to do so. Furthermore, even if they are able to implement this, I still think they'll need to keep this postmodern roller coaster ride going in perpetuity. Because they've been pushing fear over climate change for decades, but it's never caught on. So they're going to need to keep the public in a constant state of hysteria beyond 2030. And just like with the pandemic, when it becomes clear that the threat isn't what they're saying it is, the science on climate change is going to have to be changed constantly in order to sustain the illusion. I don't think they'll be able to say, this is the science and that's final. They'll have to constantly explain away more and more contradictions. This is why I'm not so sure this system will last forever, but the damage it will cause is concerning to say the least. I think the real red pill in present day clown world isn't realizing that one of their countless mini narratives is false, but realizing that all these narratives are a charade being put on by a hostile globalist elite. That in the short term, we need to disconnect from their system and not buy into their clown show, and that in the long term, we need to clear them out. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, please consider following me on Odyssey as well, a platform which supports free speech. You can follow me on Telegram as well. I was recently banned from Patreon, so if you'd like to support my channel, I'll link below several alternative methods. Thank you for listening. Till next time, Endeavor.